please remain standing as we honor God's word this morning. I want to read from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And Apostle Paul tells us the story of Christmas really in very short terms. He says, The Son, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that is, that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Let's pray together. God, we come before You today and just praise You for what You have done, God. Jesus, we thank You that You are the invisible image of God that we would never experience, but You have come to this earth as a baby to bring redemption, to bring peace, to be Emmanuel, God, with us. So, Lord Jesus, today as we prepare to hear your word and study your word, I pray that we would be able to all open up our hearts and our minds for your spirit to work in our lives, that you would bring us the convictions that we may need, that you would bring us the truth that we may need to embrace or, or the transformation that we may receive from your word today, God. Speak to us today in your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, guys. Good morning. How is everyone here this morning? Good? You guys are here despite the rain. You are brave people. <laughs> so this morning, before we continue, I want to make sure that I let you know one more time, in case you missed the announcements or you weren't paying attention, next Sunday morning, we will not be having three services, okay? We will only have one morning service, so I don't want you to show up here at 8 o'clock and find out, why is, why is there nobody here? What, what's going on? We will have our morning Christmas Eve service, which would be like a normal Sunday morning service, but then we will have two Christmas Eve services at 5 o'clock and 6.30. There will be completely different services, okay? So there's these cards in your guys or in the back. Make sure you invite your friends. Um, make sure, let's, let's pack this place up and worship God together, and it will be a great opportunity for us to invite people who don't go to church or don't know the love of Jesus to share the love of Christ with them and to share the gospel with them. But this morning, as we continue our series called The Due Dates, my sermon title is The Checklist, and I have to make sure I enunciate this well because I was talking to Vince earlier this week, and he said, what is the title of the sermon? I said, Checklist. And I said, you're talking about chicks in the church? I said, no, 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 not the chick list. It's the checklist, okay? So, it, so if you hear me say chick list, just ignore it, and that's a different story there. <laughs> but this morning as we look at them, um, you may say, well, Colossians doesn't really have anything to do with Christmas. I think what Paul has done in short has told us the whole story of Christmas and why Christ has come, being the invisible image of God, being born into this earth, and the whole fullness of God dwelling in Him for the very purpose of reconciling us to God with His blood shed on the cross. And as we talk about that, I think that God has hardwired each one of us, each and every one of us, to be individuals who prepare. Now, some of you may not agree with me, saying, no, I don't prepare, I'm a procrastinator, I'm a this or that. But I think that God has hardwired us to prepare for things. All of us prepare for something or another. We spend our majority of our time preparing for our future. Um, some of us prepare by looking for better jobs so we can get paid more, so we can have a better uh, um, life, easier life. Some of us look for a spouse because we want to have, have kids prepare for our future. Some of us um, look for ways to buy homes. Some of us look for retirement plans. Some all constantly we are we are trying to prepare. Some of us look for vacation spots. Constantly we are preparing, looking for hope, looking for rest, looking for different things. We are individuals that are created in the image of God to prepare for things. But the problem is that because of the sin in the world, what we end up doing is our preparation is mostly based on our petty human desires, so we are satisfied with the immediate gratification rather than the ultimate gratification. And what I mean with that is our, even our ultimate understanding of, of eternal life, our ultimate um, desires are based on our petty worldly desires, so we don't fully understand what it means to prepare for eternal life. 
And that's why we need Christ. That's why Proverbs 21, 31 says, um, The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests in the Lord. Now, I don't, this is not what this passage says, but if I were that horse, okay, and I'm prepared for the battle, I've been made ready for the battle, but what kind of a difference does it make if I'm in the wrong army? You see, I can prepare and prepare, but as long as I'm not um, gratified in the ultimate satisfaction, which comes from Christ and comes from what He gives us, then it doesn't really matter what army I am in. All it matters is that I'm going to be defeated at the end. So that's, that's what I want to talk about this morning. And I think um, I want to give you some notes. Um, I want to give you some checklists, okay? And I want you to write them down only if you're going to really commit to them. Otherwise, they're just pieces of written things that are not important. But I think that God has laid these in my heart to share with you because these are simple elements of truth that we need to commit to for this coming season and next year, hopefully, just be prepared for something that God can do in our ultimate sense of understanding of Him. So if you have your Bibles, would you open up to Luke chapter 1? We're not going to read Luke chapter 1. I just want to point out something as we move forward. But if you don't have a Bible... Would you raise your hands? Our ushers will bring you one. You can keep a gift from us. But Luke chapter 1 starts with the story of John the Baptist being born and, and tells us the story of how the angel comes and visits um, Elizabeth and Zechariah and tells them they're going to have a baby in their old age. But John, uh, what Zechariah do he, to his unbelief, he becomes mute. And, and then he goes on, Luke chapter 1 goes on and tells us the story of how Jesus is conceived, which we looked at um, a couple weeks ago as Gabriel, which his name means God is my strength, comes and visits Mary and says, you're going to be conceived and have, um, by the Holy Spirit and have a baby. His name is going to be Jesus. And it's really interesting, something that I didn't pay attention to often, <coughs> excuse me, that I've not paid close attention to before, was as I was reading, reading this this week, kind of hit me, is if you look at when Mary is conceived with Jesus, she goes and visits Elizabeth, who is a family member, and John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, and goes visits Elizabeth, and as she visits Elizabeth, and I don't know how it all happened, maybe she got off her mule and went and knocked on the door, you know, and, and Elizabeth opens the door, and it tells us, my Bible titles is Mary's song, and Mary suddenly burst out into singing a song. I'm like, wow, this is a cool greeting. Like, open the door, Elizabeth letting Mary starts singing a song of praise to God. And, and it's really interesting. Um, nine verses are dedicated to the song that, that Mary sings. But then that's not where it stops. Then chapter 1 of Luke goes on to the next page in my Bible. goes to the, um, the story of John the Baptist being born. Just a few months later, John the Baptist is being born. And Zechariah, who is mute, says that he wants... His, his tongue opens this. His name is going to be John. And then as soon as his tongue opens, verse 67, Zechariah bursts out into a song. And I'm like, man, Jesus' whole family, they're like all singers and songwriters. What is wrong with these people? It's amazing. And I'm like, anybody ever written a song here before? Raise your hands. Okay, people have written songs. No, people have never written a song know that it's hard to write a song, okay? People have written a song know for sure that it's hard to write a song because it doesn't always come naturally. Sometimes people have to spend time being inspired by things. And I, I, I kind of found it really interesting that these guys are just like coming out and, and bursting out into songs. And I had to think about this. There's something behind this. And I did some research. And I, that's why I want you to go home and read these passages. And maybe if you have a study Bible, kind of look at it. Because all the songs, the, both of the songs that they sing, they sing them because they have the Word of God hidden in their hearts. Because all the words from the songs are, majority of the words are taken either from different parts of the scripture, from Psalms, from Genesis, from this part, from that part, from Jeremiah. And both Mary and Zechariah combine these words together to praise God in the circumstances that they are in. And it's imperative for us to understand because here's what I want you to do. Before we go into our point, before we go into our main thing that we're going to study, I want you to write this down. This season I commit to ensure that God's word is planted deeply in my heart. Because if God's word is deeply planted, I know it's a simple thing and you hear this all the time at church, but if God's word is planted in your heart, then no matter what the circumstances, you are able, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are able to burst out into a song of praise that brings glory and honor to God. Okay, you guys still with me? Good. All right, so now let's move on. We're going to study Luke chapter 2 this morning as we focus on what Paul said that God was pleased that the whole fullness of, Christ, of, of Him dwell in Christ, okay? So verse 1 starts like this, says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. 
This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria, and everyone went there to their own town to register. Now, I've said this before, every time you see a detail like this, why would Luke have to mention a detail like this? This in particular is an important detail because Luke wants you to know that this is a historical event that took place. So in case you don't really believe it, you can go probably check in the, in, in the Roman history and see that really um, Caesar Augustus really did issue this decree. But there is also another important element to it that, <coughs> excuse me, that at the time the Roman Empire was really huge. And... Caesar Augustus wanted to see how many people are under his rule because he wanted to boast about that. He wanted to tell the whole world and write in his stories that I had this many people that belonged to my government, that, that were under my authority. But as he's, as he's planning to this census, what he doesn't understand, and here's what I want us to see, is that every time we try to prepare for something that, that maybe brings us boast and uh, help us boast about ourselves, God is doing something else through our mistakes, okay? And Caesar Augustus is issuing this decree and planning to see how powerful he is. But God is planning through his mistake, through his boastfulness, God is planning to, to bring about the prophecy that has already been written. So because of Caesar Augustus, Mary and Joseph had to head to Bethlehem where the prophecy has said that the Messiah is supposed to be born. Okay, so really he plays a major role into that. And sometimes even the unbelievers play a major role in what God has in store for his people. But, but it says, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem to the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Would you touch your neighbor and say we are expecting? <laughs> you didn't know it, huh? <laughs> oh, you may not be expecting your baby, but you're expecting something, Okay. Now, as we finish the year and we go into the next year coming quick, all of us are entering the year with our expectations. All of us are expecting something. Maybe a baby for some of you, I don't know. Maybe for some of you, you're expecting um, a better job. Maybe you're expecting to finish your school. Maybe you're expecting to get married. Maybe you're expecting um, to die. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully not, right? But everybody is expecting something. And as you're expecting for things, you prepare for those things. See, oftentimes, or we anticipate those things. And as we anticipate those things, we make plans based on our expectations. And it tells us that Mary and Joseph were expecting a baby. But meanwhile, as they're expecting the baby, so they know a baby is coming. As they're expecting a baby, they're going to register to, for the baby to be born. And it tells, them, it tells us that, that while they were there, a time came for the baby to be born. Now, mothers, raise your hands. Natural birth mothers, keep your hands up, okay? Now, how many, uh, now put your arms down. Both parents, I, I want you to help me with this as well, okay? Both parents, how many of you parents who were expecting when your baby was about to come had your checklist to make sure that you have everything when you go to the hospital? Raise your hands, okay? See, quite a few of us, right? Now, how many of you took everything on that checklist, okay? So some of you, good. Well, so here, here's the interesting part that happens. So while they were there, okay, expecting a baby, the time came. And when the time comes, the time comes, okay? So you can't be a parent and say, hey, baby, you got to hold on for 48 hours, okay? Stay in the stomach. I, I can't give birth to you. I'm not ready yet. You can't do that. So the time comes for the baby to be born. And I don't know the whole story, okay? I don't, we, we, we don't know how it played out, but it could be that, that Mary and Joseph went to, to Hilton Hotel and said, hey, uh, we need a room. And they said, sorry, it's the holiday season, no room available right now. So they go, okay, well, let's go to Catalina Inn and see if there's a room. So we go to Catalina Inn and Catalina said, no, there's no. Well, they say, okay, we are expecting a baby. We should, maybe we should go to a hospital instead. So they go to Oro Valley Hospital and say, no, wrong place. We have no room for a baby to be born. And finally, somebody comes and says, listen, I have a stable for you. You can take that. And now they have no choice but to go to that stable. And it tells us, it tells us, and she gave, when it, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Because there was no guest room available for them. Now, I had to really think hard about this. I know we have all heard the story of, of 
Christmas many times, and I had to think hard about this. I mean, this is the Son of God we're talking about. We're talking about God, the Creator. I mean, I mean, Paul started us, as we read, said that in Him all things were created. That everything was created in Him and for Him. All governments, all authorities, everything was created in Him. Why would He choose? Because ultimately He had to choose to be born in a manner. Why would He choose to be born in a stable? I mean, couldn't He have been born in the most deluxe hospital in the world? Couldn't He... Couldn't he be born in this only seven-star hotel in, in the world, which is in Dubai? He could have, but why would he choose to be born in the stable? And why would the scripture tell us there was no guest room available for him? Now, now, I don't know about you guys, but every time my wife and I expect guests, when we are expecting guests to come to our house, here's what we do. We clean the house really well, okay? Normally our house is filthy, but every time we're expecting a guest, we clean the house really well. And we have two, two monster kids that just tear the whole house apart, so we clean it really well. And sometimes, sometimes we have to like three times, I have to like mop the floor 50 times during the day because my kids make a mess. So we clean and we clean when we are expecting a guest. We prepare the guest room, we wash the, the, the sheets. My wife washes the sheets and the blankets and the towels. And, and my wife is so sweet, she even gets some candy and puts on top of the towels. So when the guests come, they feel um, loved and important. But here, here's something really that we all have in common in this. When a guest comes to our house, you know what happens? happens a guest leaves the house and if the guest comes to your house and things don't work out and you and the guest get into an argument you say this is my house get out <laughs> and that's just the reality of who we are but Jesus did not come to be a guest you see there's a difference that's why God wanted us to read this story that's why God wanted us to understand this story because there was no guest room available for him because in your hearts there is no guest room available for Christ because if he comes as a guest into your heart guess what when things don't work out you're gonna either kick him out or when the time comes say you've been there for so long would you please leave God but he came to occupy the stable in your hearts and here's, here's something that, that oftentimes you, in America we don't pay attention to. See, when I moved to the States, I'd never seen nativity scenes and things like that. So it was very new to me. When I moved to the States, I saw the nativity scene for the first time. And it's supposed to remind us that, uh, of the story of the stable. It's supposed to remind us of, of Jesus being born in a stable and being put in a manger and being wrapped in cloths and donkeys and animals around and Mary who, uh, all there and Joseph there and the wise men come. And all the nativity scene stuff, you know, it's really cool, but it's lacking something. And guys, we should write this down and next year give this a try because, because if you want a true nativity scene, this is what you need, okay? Write this down. This is important. If you want the true fragrance of Christmas next year for your nativity scene, go buy some sheep or, or, or cow manure and put it around it. Because anybody been to a stable before? It doesn't smell like pumpkin. It, it doesn't smell like cinnamon. So if you want a true fragrance of Christmas, you really need to have some manure around because then you will understand why Christ came. Then you will understand that Christ did not come to be smelling like cinnamon because the world didn't smell like that. The world smelled like manure when he entered it. And he entered your hearts as you smelled like manure. He entered your hearts as you were filthier than filthy and he did not enter a perfect guest room that, was, that had candy all over it and sweet and everywhere and it smelled so good. No, he entered your heart while, hearts where you were filthy people. So he has not come to be a guest, but he has come to occupy the stable in your heart because he knows from there he can clean and cleanse every filth that is there. So write it down. This season I commit to ensure that Jesus is not a guest in my heart. Because if he's a guest, you're going to ask him to leave or you think that his time will, the time will come for him to leave. But if you, your heart was created for him, then in him you will be renewed and in him, the filth will be washed away because he will clean that stable that he is in right now in your hearts. And I love how Luke is telling his story. You know, Luke has this way of changing subjects without really changing subjects. And I, I really like it. Um, and he goes, so Jesus is born and he's in a stable. Then he jumps, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. 
Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Now listen to this. This is really cool. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and, to earth, and, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, now before I get to my point, i got to say this because this is cool. Okay, i got to say this. Anybody love concerts around here? When maybe Casting Crowns, Mercy Me, the Christian concerts, or Chris Tomlin, they come to town. Maybe some of you go and, and uh, listen to the concert because it's fun. Now, how cool was that? The shepherds are in the field, and a heavenly host of angels come, and there's a free concert given to them by angels. Now, that's pretty cool, guys. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay? But that's a different story. That's not what I'm preaching about. <laughs> But I, I, I thought, you know, as Luke tells the story, you look at, first of all, so Jesus is born into the filthy stable, and then he talks about these shepherds, and tells them that there's going to be a sign to them that this baby is born in a way that they would understand. Why would God choose the shepherds? You know, they, they, did, a survey, they did a survey a while back and asked a ton of people, said, hey, if you could relate to a char- Christmas character, which one would you relate to, relate to the most? And everybody said shepherds. A majority of the people said shepherds because they were ordinary people, they said, that were invited to see the king of kings. Now, even though I understand the point of view that most people say, I think I personally would rather, uh, I would uh, um, define myself as a sheep, really, <laughs> in that, um, but the shepherds, you know, they, I can understand why, why, pe- why people think that they would relate to the shepherds the most, but I think, in a sense, they are wrong as well. The shepherds weren't really ordinary people. In fact, they were below ordinary people. And this was not God's intention in the beginning because obviously the history of, of creation begins with, with Adam's descendants being shepherds. And But time goes on and shepherds were, were filthy people according to the Egyptians and history goes on. And, and even though this was not God's intention, when Romans took over and people are waiting for the Messiah, the Jews are waiting for the Messiah to appear. Now this culture is still shifting and molding and shepherds come back to being the filthy people again. But then there's, a, there's an added addition to why shepherds were, were filthy people is because uh, when people were waiting for the Messiah, they formed their own sects of Christianity and spiritual leaders, especially the Pharisees, considered the shepherds as, as ceremonially unclean people why because the law said for instance they can't touch the carcass of dead animals but often shepherds had to touch the dead carcasses because what if there was a dead animal lying in the field and and it would attract predators what if uh, an animal would try to attack the sheep and they had to kill it and 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 touch it what if it's so many different reasons they, they would have to that was just one of the reasons okay it's a simple reason but but they couldn't also in, in the field they couldn't really get themselves cleansed ceremonially but one of the most important reasons why shepherds were considered ceremonially unclean was because when you are a shepherd you can't go to your sheep saying listen i've been taking care of you for the past six days but today is the sabbath man you're on your own you can't do that because sheep are dumb and they will get themselves killed. So a shepherd has to work seven days a week without having to take the Sabbath. And to the Pharisees and spiritual leaders, that was not good. So they were ceremonially unclean. So why would God choose shepherds like that? Because God always chooses those who nobody else expects to be elevated, to elevate. And God always gives those people a sign telling them that, listen, you may think that you are below average people. You may think that you are not worthy. You may think that nobody cares for you. You may think that you're not important, but I have come to show you a sign. And here's a sign for you. A baby will be born and will be in a way that you don't maybe desire or understand because how likely would it be for these shepherds to go and, listen, if the angel came and said, there's a sign for you. A baby is born in Hilton Hotel. He's in room 337. How likely would these shepherds be to go and visit the baby? But see, God came and gave them. You see, they're not expecting anything from God, obviously. But God comes and tells them, here's here's a sign for you. Here's a way that you understand. You are used to the filth in this world. You're used to it. And I will send a baby into the filth in this world so you can relate to it and you can understand it. And here's what I want you to understand from this story is that this Christmas season, you commit to ensure that you recognize the many signs that God has placed in your life. 
Because as you read this story, some of you don't realize that there's so many signs that God is right now putting in your lives. And some of them are undesirable signs. Some of them are signs that you would never think about. Some of them are signs that you're not even paying attention to. But God is using these little signs in your life to attract you to himself. To show you that he cares for you. To give you an example, when I was a new believer, I was living in Istanbul at the time. And our church had... Um, had the biggest refugee ministry at that time. The Turkey is a highway for refugees, refugees from all over the world. And, and since I came from a refugee background, my uh, passion was to serve the refugees. So I felt this calling on me, and I went to our church to volunteer. That was the only guy at the time, only male that volunteered to help, because our church only served women and children, because men could be violent oftentimes. And I, I was helping these people, and I could see the, the husbands and wives come, but the wives get help, and I could see the husbands with torn jackets in the middle of winter and torn shoes and wet clothes, and, and my heart would just break for them. So I asked, I said, God, would you give me a sign that I would know that I need to change things around, that, that we need to be able to help these guys and, and bring more people volunteer to help these guys. And God is so funny in his sense of sending a sign to you, and that's why I want you to see and understand that when God sends you a sign, sometimes it's not what you really desire or want, but he gives you a sign to show you that he's really listening to what you have for him or what you're asking him. So God sent this guy from Congo who spoke very, very, very poor language, poor English, and no Turkish, and spoke French mainly, and he was mentally ill because of what, or mentally disabled because of what they had done to him as a, as a person before he became a refugee. And he was very violent that everybody was scared of him. And as I pray that prayer, God sends me a guy that is scary, that I want to run away from. And he comes to me with a broken English in almost French. He says to me, I need help with clothes because he was sleeping on the street. So I get him close, and as he give it to him, without, he doesn't understand because he's mentally ill. He doesn't understand what's going on, so he grabs the clothes from me like, like I'm going to snatch him from him. He grabs him from me and runs away because he doesn't want somebody else to snatch him from his hands. And I knew that was a sign from God that I, this is a ministry that I, was, I needed to be in at that moment. And the reason I tell you this may maybe not relate to what we're reading here about this story, but about the story of the birth of Christ, but I think that God has given you each signs this season. Each one of you, if you examine your lives, you will see these signs in your lives, and you will see that God has something for you that He's trying to show you that He has a plan for your lives. So you need to be paying attention to those signs. So after the concert of the angels, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and, and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child, told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. See, God chose the lowly people, the people. See, one of the important things about shepherds is that they're always alone majority of the time yeah they would come together and they would they would um, maybe share they would come bring the sheep to water them or feed them or something or or they would come to share talk about the roots that they're taking so they're not all going the same spot for the grazing purpose but oftentimes they were alone in the fields and anybody who has any psychological or psych background in psychology knows that when you are an individual who's always alone you either start talking to the sheep or when you find an opportunity to talk to somebody, man, you won't shut up. And you have all had people like that in your lives. And God knows, see, God knows that's why He chooses individuals for a purpose. So God chose these shepherds and revealed to them something that they could not resist, a, a concert given to them by the angels and a baby who was born to be the Messiah. And now, see, here's, if you're a shepherd, you have these, this privilege as well that everybody would come to you and buy sheep from you because they wanted them for the sacrificial purposes or everybody would come to them because they were taking care of their sheep or, or people would just come to them for different purposes because they needed meat maybe or whatever it is and as these people came these shepherds could not shut up about what they had seen and the word got spread out but what, what, if, what, if, what if God had gone to Caesar Augustus and an angel appeared to him and said listen there's baby being born he would only be threatened. What if God had gone to these spiritual leaders and, and done that? They would have not paid attention to it because this God was not being born in a, in a clean spot. So it was ceremonially unclean anyways. 
But God chose the lowly people, the lonely people, the people who are not worthy according to the others to spread the word that is beyond, beyond comprehension. So this Christmas season, I want you to understand something for yourself, to commit to ensure that you will be quick in spreading the word about Jesus. Because if this king has chosen to dwell in your hearts, you have to see that there's a reason he has chosen you. There's a reason why he has called you to himself. Now, if you have not paid attention to anything I've said, please pay attention to these last few words because this is, this is imperative, this is important, this is so powerful, not from me but from God. Remember what I, we read when we began from Colossians? God was pleased to have the whole fullness of God to dwell in Him. Who is Him? Jesus. God was pleased, let me say it one more time, to have the fullness of God to dwell in Jesus. Okay? Are you guys still with me? Okay. The fullness of God in Jesus. The fullness of God. God has chosen to dwell in the stable of your hearts. Now pay attention to this because it's powerful. The fullness of God in Jesus, okay? The fullness of God in Jesus. The fullness of God in the stable, in the filth, the manure-filled place which is your hearts. In other words, God has chosen to dwell in the, your hearts even though you are not worthy of His grace, even though you are not worthy of His love. He has chosen to dwell in your hearts. And that is the fullness of God. Yes, that deserves amen, whoever said that. It's the fullness of God in your hearts, fullness of God presented to you. And if the fullness of God is in your hearts, how could you not speak about Him? If the fullness of God is in your hearts, how could you, how could you consider Him a guest in your lives? If the fullness of God is in your lives, how could you be an individual who just comes to church and says, that's it? Because if God chose the shepherds, reveal himself to them he has chosen you in the same way because he knows he knows that you can relate to certain groups of people that nobody else can and he has chosen you for that very purpose so would you stand up with me as we read this passage one more time please now I read this as we began and I told you this is the whole story of Christmas, but now I want you to read this as a declaration of your faith. I want you to read this as, as a promise from God to you. The Son is the image, the Son, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Is He the supreme King in your hearts today? Is He the one who dwells in the stable of your hearts today? Because if He is, then you are in good hands. He will cleanse the manure. He will free you from the filth. Because He, with His whole full, full, fullness and wholeness is dwelling in your hearts, a person who is not worthy of God's grace. And because of His blood, by His blood, He's reconciling you to God today. So I'm going to ask the prayer team members to come forward. Guys, I'm going to encourage you, if, if you're struggling in your lives right now and you need somebody to pray with, come pray with our prayer team members. If the Spirit of God is leading you to come and just bow before Him because you know that, 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 that you have been having Christ as a guest in the guest room and you're only presenting to Him the, the cool things in your life, but you have never tried to show Him the filth that is going down right there, going on right there, today's a chance for you to free yourself maybe come like, kneel before the presence of God and pray raise your hands before him and pray come pray with one of us but today is a day where you can be set free if you are already free today is the day where you can celebrate and rejoice the birth of a Savior who has come and set you free from the filth of this world so let's pray together 
Heavenly Father, we give you praise today. We glorify you. We thank you for what you have done for us. Jesus, we thank you that you chose to come into the filth that we are in. God, thank you that you humbled yourself and you came as a man. When we were not worthy to experience you, to receive you, to know you, yet you chose each one of us and you, you chose to dwell in your whole fullness in our hearts. God, I may never understand why you did that, but what I, why I can't understand is that you love me so much, that you love everyone in this room so much, that you're willing to be the sacrificial sheep that dies on the cross. That you're willing to, to be humbled enough to die for us, to come for us, to be a baby for us, to be Emmanuel, God with us. So God, we, we can only say thank you to you because our words will not express the gratitude that we can have for you. So Lord, I pray for individuals in this room. God, I pray that no one would be able to leave this place refreshed by you or freshened by you. And, and God, no one would be able to leave this place knowing that the fullness of God can dwell in their hearts. And if He dwells in our hearts, in the stable of our hearts, then we would not shut up and we would talk about you nonstop. And everywhere we go, we would declare your truth. God, don't be a guest, please. We give you ourselves today, totally. Because we were created for you and in you and for your purpose. So use us for your glory and your honor. Jesus, in your holy name we pray. Amen.